Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was the one to be blamed for Iran's first direct attack on Israel to begin with. How will things pan out in the region? That is something that remains to be seen. Also on the show today, White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has announced that the United States of America will impose new sanctions on Iran's missile and drone program. Sullivan has said that Biden is working in coordination with international partners, including G7 nations, on a comprehensive response to Iran's attack. All that a lot more lined up on World DNA, but first, the headlines. The United States and EU redouble efforts to press Israel for restraint after Iran's weekend attacks, promised to impose tough sanctions on Tehran's ability to sell oil and build attack drones. Iran's president calls Vladimir Putin as Tehran braces for an Israeli retaliation. Raisi tells Russian president that Iran is not interested in escalating the conflict. Seventy-four percent of the Israelis oppose counter-strike on Iran if it harms security alliances, according to a poll conducted by the Hebrew University. Former U.S. President Donald Trump speaks out against the judge overseeing his New York criminal trial. Repeatedly calls him conflicted, says the judge should not be there. A contentious bill that aims to eventually phase out smoking in Britain advanced in the parliament as the House of Commons votes in favour of the controversial measure. Days before the phase one of Lok Sabha polls in India, at least 29 miles were killed and three security personnel were injured in an encounter in Chhattisgarh. Our top focus in world DNA. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant told soldiers that the country will know how to defeat its enemies should conflict in West Asia escalate further. Right, and world leaders on the other hand have urged Israel not to retaliate after Iran launched hundreds of drones and missiles towards its territory. Galan said Iran did not have the capability to deter the Israeli military. The Israeli minister said, and I'm quoting here, any enemy that will fight against us, we will know how to hit him wherever he is. His comments come as Israeli officials have remained quiet on when and how it will respond to Iran's largely thwarted weekend attack. They will not be able to implement a different equation of deterrence against the state of Israel. The Israeli Air Force planes are operating everywhere. The skies of West Asia are open. Any enemy that will fight against us, we will know how to hit him wherever he is. Iran's deputy foreign minister said a retaliation against any possible Israeli move would come in a matter of seconds, not hours. Ali Bagari Khani told Iranian state TV that Israel will face a resolute and hard response from Iran if it makes the slightest move against Iran, its people. The U.S. State Department will also ask Israel for more information about the January death of a six-year-old Palestinian in Rajab in Gaza. The terrified girl trapped in a car with her dead family had begged for help in a call to rescuers in which gunfire could be heard as she described Israelis drawing near. U.S. officials have said that they are reviewing incidents of civilian harm in Israel's war in Gaza. They say the review is part of the process meant to ensure U.S.-provided weapons are not used in breach of international humanitarian law.
Washington intends to hit Iran with new sanctions over its unprecedented attack on Israel. The sanctions will target Iran's missile and drone program and entities supporting the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and also the Defense Ministry. Now, these actions could seek to reduce Iran's capacity to export oil. Now, for more on this, our correspondent Susan Tehrani has sent us this report from New York. Listen to this. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on Tuesday announced that the United States will impose new sanctions on Iran in response to its air attack on Israel over the weekend. According to Sullivan, the sanctions will target Iran's missile and drone program, as well as entities supporting the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and Iran's defense ministry. The U.S. says that it expects allies and partners to follow with their own set of sanctions Additionally, the United States will continue to strengthen air and missile defense systems in the Middle East region to counter Iran's capabilities. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, in a Fox News interview, Pentagon spokesperson Sabrina Singh was asked about the Biden administration's response should Israel ask for help in a potential assault against the Islamic Republic. Sin emphasized that the decision to respond to Iran is a sovereign one for Israel to make and that the United States wants to avoid a wider regional conflict. When pressed about whether the U.S. would help Israel if asked, Sin declined to answer quote-unquote hypotheticals and reiterated that the United States does not seek war with Iran. Now, while the U.S. has urged Israel to show restraint, Israel has already conducted airstrikes against the Iranian terror proxy group Hezbollah in Lebanon. Susan Tehrani reporting from New York for We On World Is One. Now, nearly three quarters of the Israeli public oppose a retaliatory strike on Iran for its massive missile attack on the country. Right, and that is if such an action would harm Israel's security alliance with its allies. And this is according to a poll published by the Hebrew University. The survey found that 74% of the public opposes a counter-strike if it undermines Israel's security alliance with its allies. Meanwhile, 26% are in favor of an attack even if it damages ties with allies. The survey also found that over 56% of the respondents believe that Israel should respond positively to political and military demands from its allies, while 12% disagreed. On the other hand, the European Union will start the necessary work to hit Iran with heavier sanctions after Saturday's aerial attack on Israel. After this meeting, uh, we will increase our outreach with the key partners in the region and some member states propose the adoption of uh, uh, expand the restrictive measures against Iran, adopting an expansion of restrictive measures against Iran. I will send to the external action service the request to start the necessary work related to these sanctions. Now, the proposal would expand a sanctions regime that seeks to curb the supply of Iranian drones to Russia so that it would also include the provision of missiles and could also cover deliveries to proxies in West Asia. Meanwhile, Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has also reacted to the Iranian attack on Israel. Well, he said that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was the main one to blame for the attack. Take a listen. Netanyahu, siyasi ömrünü uzatmak adına... Netanyahu is endangering the lives of both his own citizens and the people of the region to extend his political life. This is an indisputable fact, the one responsible for the tension that made our hearts skip a beat on the night of April 13th is Netanyahu and his government, which is seeing red. Earlier, Turkey had called for an end to the escalation in West Asia, saying there was a risk of setting off a regional war. European leaders, too, have reached out to Israel for non-retaliation. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak called on his Israeli counterpart 
to allow calm heads to prevail following the weekend's attack from Iran. In a call, Sunak stressed that major escalation was in no one's interest and would only deepen insecurity in West Asia. British Foreign Secretary David Cameron is set to la land in Israel today for a one-day visit. On his visit, Cameron will meet Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Foreign Mis uh, Minister Israel Katz and possibly War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try and engage. It's not saying change through trade. That's not a... And a correspondent, Jody Cohen, spoke with the former advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and military expert Colonel Miri Eisen on how the shadow war between Israel and Iran is now out in the open. The colonel also spoke about Israel's Rafa operation. Take a listen. Israel is expected to respond to Iran's attack. The US and UK have warned about a regional escalation. How wise or easy would it be for Israel to go it alone in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation with Iran? Iran has been at war with Israel long before their April 14th attack. They joined in openly from uh, October 7th using their proxies. For Israel to respond, it's not only against the Iranian regime, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, it's against the proxies, it's against all those that have been attacking Israel from October 7th and before. One of the aspects that happened that was unique on April 14th was Israel's cooperation with other countries. I think it would be wise if we continue to do so. Now, the U.S. reportedly believes that Israel's response won't be directly to Iran, but could be to an Iranian proxy in the region. What do you think Israel's response could be? When we talk about the military, we have a tendency to focus on what we call the hardware, like the Iranian open attack against us on April 14th. But there are lots of other realms. You can be in the cyber domain. You can be in the space domain. And of course, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards export their capabilities worldwide. You could go against the different proxies and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards themselves that are positioned all over the world. Before Iran's attack, we'd been hearing about Israel's plans to target Hamas in Rafah. We're now hearing that that could have been put on ice. What more can you tell us? Hamas's terror military capabilities have been systematically destroyed by Israel over the last six months. The only area left that has not been touched is Rafah. Israel will do so. It doesn't have to be tomorrow morning. It may be deferred, but it will happen, if not now, in the future. Meanwhile, the Kremlin has said that Iran's president has called Vladimir Putin to discuss the attack on Israel. This is the Iran braces for an Israeli retaliation. According to the official statement from the Kremlin, President Putin has expressed hope that all sides will show reasonable restraint and prevent a confrontation that could have catastrophic consequences for the entire region. Iranian media has quoted Raisi of declaring that Iran would respond more severely, extensively and painfully than ever to any action against Iran's interests. Russia, which has forged close ties with both Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and Arab leaders, has repeatedly slammed the West for ignoring the need for an independent Palestinian state within 1967 borders. Putin, in his first publicly aired comments on Iran's attack, said that the root cause of the current instability in West Asia was the unresolved conflict between Palestinians and Israel. Meanwhile, U.S. intelligence officials say Tehran's growing partnership with Moscow is strengthening the capabilities of both the countries. Ukraine and the U.S. have claimed that Iran has provided Russia with a large number of powerful surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missiles and drones that Moscow has used in Ukraine. And according to military analysts, the expanded ties have helped Moscow and Tehran cement agreements. They include a pledge by Russia to provide its ally with advanced fighter jets and air defense technology. And these assets could help Tehran strengthen its defenses against any future airstrike by Israel or the United States. And on day two of former U.S. President Donald Trump's hush money trials, seven jurors were selected. 
Right in the selection procedure continues to choose panel of 12 members and six alternates who can be fair to the former U.S. President Donald Trump. Now this process it started with jurors going through a questionnaire phase in which they were questioned by the district attorney's office and Trump's lawyers as well. The panelists selected included an information technology worker, an English teacher, an oncology nurse, a sales professional, a software engineer and two lawyers. During the procedure, Trump appeared nonchalant and was frequently flipping through the process, often leaning back in his chair. And in one instance, Trump was audibly muttering while one of jurors was speaking. Former U.S. President spoke against the judge overseeing the trial and called him conflicted. We are going to uh, continue our fight against this judge. We think he's totally conflicted. He's a conflicted judge, as you know. We're an appeal. Uh, I don't think there has ever been a judge more conflicted than this one. So we'll see how that all works out. We're having a hard time. We're having a hard time with the New York State system. It's under watch by the whole world, and uh, it's not looking very good. So we, we think we have a very conflicted, highly conflicted judge who shouldn't be on the case. And he's rushing this trial and he's doing as much as he can for the Democrats. This is a Biden-inspired witch hunt and it should end. And it should end very quickly. Thank you very much. Trump further went on to say that he does not think that he violated the gag order, which is prohibiting him from talking to witnesses in his New York trial. This comes as prosecutors ask Judge Juan Mershon to sanction Trump for what they say were violations. The Manhattan case accuses the Republican contestant for 2024 presidential elections of falsifying business records to cover up a sex scandal during his 2016 campaign. The first criminal trial facing former President Donald Trump is also the one in which Americans are least convinced that he committed a crime. A new AP North Center report on public affairs research polls finds that only about one-third of the U.S. adults think that Trump did something illegal, while close to half think that he did something illegal in the other three criminal cases pending against him. And they're fairly skeptical that Trump is getting a fair shake from the prosecutors in the case so that the judge and the jurors can be impartial. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's plan to ban smoking has advanced in Parliament. As the House of Commons voted in favour of the measure, although dozens of his own lawmakers have voted against it as well. Now the bill passed a vote in Britain's Parliament with 383 in favour and 67 against, which means it will progress to the next stage in Parliament, where it can be subject to amendment will not affect current smokers' rights or entitlements in any way. And indeed, we want to help them to quit. We are supporting them by almost doubling the funding for local stop smoke smoking services. But instead, this bill is looking to the future to give the next generation the freedom to live longer, healthier, more productive lives. The bill faced some vocal resistance against Sunak's flagship plan or to ban smoking as well. It has angered some members of his governing Conservative Party, including his predecessor, former Prime Minister Liz Truss and Boris Johnson, who say the state should not interfere in how the people live their lives. In addition to that, the former Prime Minister's Liz Truss has called the move an example of the nanny state in courts in action. And Boris Johnson has described the plan as absolutely nuts. Well, the smoking ban is one of Rishi Sunak's three key policies, which he announced at the Tory party conference last year. In a major public health intervention, Rishi Sunak wants to make Generation Alpha, those who are born after 2009, the UK's first smoke-free generation. Now, if the bill is passed into a law, then anyone turning 15 from this year will be banned from buying cigarettes under the Tobacco and Wapes Bill. 
The bill will make the sale of tobacco goods illegal. Smoking itself will not be subject to fines, just the sales of those products with fines for retailers. Vaping products will be excluded from the ban, but the legislation does not seek to make vaping less attractive. By changing the packaging from today's candy-colored pastels, the bill is also said to raise the minimum age for buying tobacco every year to try and phase out smoking altogether. It is already unlawful to sell vapes to under-18s, but we want to take the powers in this legislation to consult on, for example, flavours, uh, design and so on, to ensure that vapes are uh, being sold as they should be, as they are intended, in order to help uh, adult smokers to quit, because no child should ever vape. Selling like vapes, I think, is really on the increase, and I think it's pretty dangerous. Um, I know a lot of my daughter's friends think it's cool and um, I think that's how we most of us have started because we thought it's cool. Sunar aims to pass the bill as tobacco is UK's single biggest preventable cause of death, killing two-thirds of long-term users and causing 80,000 deaths every year. Now, simmering anger against Myanmar's military government has turned into a nationwide armed resistance movement. The National Unity Government of Myanmar, or the NUG, has joined forces with the ethnic rebel groups in its bid to oust the junta. Now, the National Unity Government claims that with the help of its 300 battalions, it can penetrate through a majority of the junta's military bases in the country. Weon spoke to the NUG spokesperson Zorko, who reaffirmed that the NUG is in a position to defend itself against any military offensive in the near future. This means that uh, we, we, because of the coordinated effort and unity, and that uh, we're able to penetrate so-called the most uh, safe places and most heavily guarded places. So that showed that uh, the uh, the terrorist junta leaders, there is no safe place in Myanmar for them. Zorko also highlighted achievements of armed resistance forces. He asserted that till now, Myanmar rebels have liberated over 60% of the nation's territories from the military regime. The latest territory victory includes the key town of Mawadi, where the rebels burned down military flags on the battleground. Moving on, workers in Singapore can now seek four-day work weeks and more work from home days. And that is not all. At the end of the year, they can also opt for spaced out work timings and flexible work locations. In this new guideline, it's been announced by the Tripartite Alliance for Fair and Progressive Employment Practices. It will come into force on December 1st. While the rule is not enforceable by law, it requires all companies to set up a process for employees to submit a formal flexible working arrangement request. Now, employers can reject the request on the grounds that it will result in a significant worsening of productivity or a significant increase in cost or because it's not feasible given the nature of work. The move is in line with other countries as well. In Ireland and the United Kingdom too, governments require businesses to consider flexi work requests. And now, Singapore has joined the global trend of relaxing work arrangements to retain talent. Now, will this step benefit both companies and employees? And should other countries follow suit? That is a question that remains unanswered. And it's time now for a quick short break. But don't go anywhere, lots lined up for you on the other side as well. We'll start with Elon Musk who has proposed introducing a small fee for new users to operate basic features including site-wide bot eradication. All details on the other side, do stay tuned. Also on the other side of this short break, India will continue to be the growth engine of the world. The International Monetary Fund has revised the country's growth rate for 2024-2025, for even as global growth faces risks from inflation and geopolitical uncertainties. Stay tuned for that report on the other side of this short break.
hundreds rally in Niger capital Niamey for U.S. departure and Russia support as Russian instructors arrive to train Niger forces in the use of new military hardware. Sudan still in turmoil 365 days later as the warring paramilitary and army continue to trade barbs and wreak havoc across the nation. And in Uganda, young wrestlers dream of one day emulating their heroes and joining World Wrestling Entertainment. Watch World of Africa at these times on We On, World is One. Economic turmoil and global unrest have cast a shadow over President Joe Biden's approval ratings. The rockets are continuing to be fired by Hamas in Gaza, although at a slower rate than previously. So, right now, we are with the volunteers from the Aleppo municipality. They are still trying to go to the rescue for the people they can find out. India has emerged as a major diplomatic force at the world stage. The rising cost of living in Nigeria continues to impact citizens from all walks of life. The citizens of Gujarat witnessed a mega roadshow here in the city of Ahmedabad. China is South Africa's largest trading partner for 134 years straight. A domestic aircraft carrying 72 people on board uh, crashed in Pokhara city in central Nepal. 165 injuries have been moved. 61 people are confirmed dead and rescue operations continue around me. After receiving an entire season's rainfall in a span of 48 hours, Chennai city has literally been brought to its knees. Well, that's, uh, for we all, world is one. From the bustling trading floors of Wall Street to the vibrant exchanges of Asian stock markets, Weon breaks it down for you to make sense of what's happening as we reveal the key factors behind events, strategic battles, and the game-changing business decisions that shape the world. We bring you all of this and more on World Business Watch. Watching World DNA, a quick look at the headlines. The United States and EU redouble efforts to press Israel for restraint after Iran's weekend attacks, promised to impose tough sanctions on Tehran's ability to sell oil and build attack drones. Seventy-four percent of Israelis oppose counter-strike on Iran if it harms security alliances, according to a poll conducted by Hebrew University. In
Iran's president calls Vladimir Putin as Tehran braces for an Israeli retaliation. Raisi tells Russian president that Iran is not interested in escalating the conflict. Former U.S. President Donald Trump speaks out against the judge overseeing his New York criminal trial, repeatedly calls him conflicted, says the judge should not be there. A contentious bill that aims to eventually phase out smoking in Britain advanced in Parliament as the House of Commons vote in favour of the controversial measure. Days before the phase one of Lok Sabha polls in India, at least 29 Maoists were killed and three security personnel were injured in an encounter in Chhattisgarh. A top Maoist leader, Shankar Rao, is among those killed. Paris Saint-Germain come from behind to dump 10-man Barcelona out of the Champions League. Kylian Mbappe inspires a turnaround that saw the French champions reach the semi-final 6-4 on aggregate. All right, we're starting with news from India. A major anti-insurgency operation is underway in India's central state of Chhattisgarh where at least 29 Maoists have been killed in a police encounter. The border security forces said that the encounter took place in Chhattisgarh's Kanked district. Security forces in the Maoists exchanged fire near the Binagunda Karagota jungles. The dead included top Maoist leader Shankar Rao, who had a bounty of over $29,000. Three policemen have suffered injuries during the operation as well. The security personnel also recovered huge cache of AK-47 rifles and munitions from the spot. The Chhattisgarh police had announced cash rewards for information leading to the arrest of Maoists in the state. As per the National Crimes Records Bureau, Chhattisgarh lodged the highest number of Maoist crimes from the year 2017 to 2021. The state also topped in terms of attempted murders, loot and arson in the country. In some of the major incidents on the 26th of April last year, 10 police personnel and a civilian were killed by Maoists. Attack in April 2022, 22 police personnel were killed in crossfire along the borders of Bij Bijapur and Sukma district. In March 2018, an IED blast triggered by Maoist group killed nine policemen in the Sukma district. Well, India has deployed hundreds of troops to battle the Maoist across the insurgent-dominated region. This region is known as the Red Corridor, which stretches across several central, southern and eastern Indian states. Well, Maoist groups say that they are fighting for the rural people and the poor. All right, let's now take a look at developments from the world of technology now. Meta Platform's Oversight Board is reviewing how Meta's Instagram and Facebook handled the cases of two sexually explicit AI pictures of female stars that went viral earlier. The board will use the AI-generated pictures to evaluate Meta's policies and enforcement practices around AI-generated pornographic content. The AI-generated viral pictures were of two female public figures who were not named by the review board to prevent further harm to the women. AI advancements have made fake images indistinguishable from the real ones. And this has led to a rise in online sexual fakes that mostly target women. Industry leaders are advocating for laws to criminalize the harmful creation of deep fakes. Meta has acknowledged the review of two cases and has pledged to implement the Oversight Board's decisions. Meta's semi-independent Oversight Board is funded by Meta but operates independently.
Elon Musk has announced a new plan to tackle bot issues on social media platform X. Musk has proposed introducing a small fee for new users to operate basic features like posting and liking among others. In reply to a post on X, Musk said that traditional bot filtering tools are inefficient against advanced AI and troll farms. Musk said that the new users would be able to post after three months without paying a fee. However, specifics on the fee amount and plans implementation dates are still unclear. This move by Musk is similar to one already introduced to new users in New Zealand and the Philippines which again requires new accounts to pay a $1 annual fee to post, like, reply and more. Artificial intelligence technology is helping industries globally and this is the latest. The New York State Tax Department is using AI to hunt down wealthy remote workers. The department is sending out AI-generated letters. The letters are mostly being sent to people who have changed their permanent address or are working remotely. Understand that during the pandemic, many wealthy individuals and families moved from high-tax states like California and New York to low-tax states like Florida and Texas. The State Department claims that the change of address was done in an illegal manner. Most of these residents did not pay the state tax. They instead moved and took their tax dollars with them. the world of business now, India will continue to be the growth engine of the world. Right, the International Monetary Fund has revised the country's growth rate for 2024 to 25, even as global growth faces risk from inflation and geopolitical uncertainties. The global lender raised its forecast from 6.5% to 6.8%, which will help India remain the fastest growing large economy. Two big factors played a role in the IMF revising its growth forecast for Asia's third largest economy. Number one, strong domestic demand and number two, rising working age population. The agency also raised the growth figure for the previous fiscal year that ended on March 31st from 6.7% to 7.8%. That's a little higher than India's official growth estimate of 7.6%. The latest revision comes at a time when India will vote in a seven-phase election starting from April 19th. Meanwhile, the IMF also improved its forecast for the global economy this year. It cited resilience in the United States and some emerging economies as the reason for increased optimism in the global economy. Global economic activity is likely to expand 3.2% this year, up 0.1 percentage point from its January estimate. The forecasts for 2024 remain unchanged at 3.2%, but the agency also warned that the outlook remains cautious amid persistent inflation and geopolitical risks. Moreover, high borrowing costs and the withdrawal of fiscal support are weighing on short-term growth. The medium-term outlook, on the other hand, remains the weakest in decades due to low productivity and global trade tensions. Well, Haim, the question in everybody's mind right now is that will Israel strike back? And that is what oil traders bet on. Right now, oil traders wager on $250 price by June as the war risk escalates. As geopolitical concerns are elevated, oil traders have poured into almost 3 million barrels of contracts, betting that crude prices would jump to $250 a barrel by June. About 3,000 lots of June up to $50 derivatives contracts in U.S. crude traded for a penny each on Tuesday. Now, the market was like a lottery ticket that might pay off if prices spiked to levels unheard off by the middle of next month. Volumes of bullish oil bets have also skyrocketed to a record after Israel vowed to respond to Iran's weekend missile and drone attack. Almost 350,000 contracts of Brent crude traded Monday, eclipsing the previous record set in 2019. Those contracts also deepened their premium over bets against oil price in the biggest since October as Israel flagged its intention to strike back. 
Traders have turned to the oil options market to hedge against the possibility of higher oil prices caused by disruption in supplies from the West Asia conflict. In addition to robust demand and tight supplies, the region's ongoing turmoil has sent Brent futures to a five-month high of above $90 a barrel. Well, a massive fire damaged Copenhagen's iconic old stock exchange in what has been described as a national disaster. Absolutely, Raisha. The landmark is one of the best known buildings in the Danish capital. The spire collapsed in a scene reminiscent of the 2019 blaze at the Notre Dame in Paris. The fire broke out in the 17th century building on Tuesday morning. The historic Dutch style building no longer houses the stock exchange however it did serve as the chamber of commerce headquarters ah. several hundred pieces of art and artifacts including paintings mirrors chandeliers and timepieces were saved by firefighters before flames destroyed most of the interior emergency services and employees from the danish chamber of commerce including the chamber's head Brian Mickelson was among those helping to carry paintings out of the building. Fire trucks surrounded the building covered in scaffolding and canvas as huge plumes of black smoke billowed from the rooftop. Danish rescue services said they could not give any guarantees that the facade of the building could be saved. Parts of the roof have also collapsed in the blaze. Following the blaze, Mickelson stated that the board has already decided that they would build the stock exchange. It's an, it's an office building, but it's a very historic building uh, dating back to the 1820, uh, 1620. So it's a very historic building and a lot of old valuable paintings inside the building as well. So they are trying to, to rescue all that uh, that's, uh, possible. The images recall the disaster at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, which almost five years ago to the day was gutted by flames. Parisians shed tears as fire brought down the ancient spire. Witnesses in Copenhagen also fought to hold back tears as they watched the devastation. It's a 400-year-old building that has survived all the other fires that burned down Copenhagen to the ground. Uh, so it's, it's a dreadful loss. While firefighters are working to contain the blaze, officials said they blocked off parts of the city centre as part of the firefighting efforts. It is yet to be determined what caused the fire.